A few years ago, Lana got a Dutch oven. You know what that is? Like a real big, heavy pot. And it was from the brand Le Creuset. Am I saying that right? Is that, that the name of the pot? And when she was opening up this, this Dutch oven, I noticed something inside that kind of caught me off guard for a piece of, you know, kitchen equipment. It said lifetime guarantee. That's a long time. That means if you use this pot, okay, and it breaks, for the rest of your natural life, they're going to replace that Lake Crusade pot. I mean, that's a long time. And I feel as though the, the quality of a product is directly related to the length of the guarantee, wouldn't you? And the more secure, I'm going to have more security based on the longer guarantee. Now, uh, somebody came up to me after the last service and said, Pastor, we have one of those pots and we replace it three times. So maybe, maybe that's not the reason. But I know this. You have been given something even better than a lifetime guarantee from the Lord. You've been given an eternal guarantee of salvation. And I want to talk about that this morning as we continue in our series about the full armor of God. Would you turn in your Bibles back to Ephesians chapter 6 with me? I'm going to read for us in verses 10 to 20 in just a moment. As you can imagine, we're looking at one particular element of the armor. If you looked on the, the pulpit here, you saw this helmet. We're looking at the helmet that we need to take up in battle. So you look on verses 10 to 20 as I read. Finally, be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. For this reason, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having prepared everything to take your stand. Stand therefore with truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest, and your feet sandaled with readiness for the gospel of peace. In every situation, take up the shield of faith which, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And here we are, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray at all times in the spirit with every prayer and request and stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. Pray also for me that the message may be given to me when I open my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. For this I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I might be bold enough to speak about it as I should. What a powerful passage. We're talking about the helmet of salvation. Now, folks, it's not that difficult to understand the significance of the helmet when it speaks of armor, right? Because it's protecting your most precious commodity. If you lose the head, the body doesn't matter, all right? So the, the helmet's very important. And in this case, we're talking about the helmet of salvation. Incidentally, this is not the only place in Scripture Paul mentions the helmet and equates it to salvation. First Thessalonians, chapter 5 verse 8 says but since we belong to the day let us be self-controlled and put on the armor of faith and love and a helmet of the hope of salvation so we have even more clarity here the hope of salvation in both cases the helmet is associated with salvation so what is salvation salvation is the deliverance of a person from danger or death it is the act of a rescue the fact of our salvation, our rescue, is profoundly important to how we fight our spiritual battles in our lives. We're going to face spiritual battle. That's inevitable. We're in a spiritual war right now. But this helmet of salvation plays a critical role in how you do your spiritual battles. And I want to share with you three reasons I believe this is true. That if you could really understand the helmet of salvation, the significance of the hope that God has given us in salvation, it will make us victorious in battle. And I share those reasons with you. Here's the first reason. Salvation gives me assurance. Now listen, don't miss this reason because this reason is the foundation on which we build the other two reasons. Salvation gives us assurance in Jesus Christ. Here's a curious question maybe you thought about when you read this passage. If Paul's talking to Christians, and clearly he is, about engaging in spiritual warfare, he obviously isn't telling them to experience salvation for the first time. So why do they need to put on the helmet of salvation? They're already saved. And here's the answer. 
He's charging them to embrace the promise, the benefits, and the blessing that comes from the knowledge of salvation and to be secure in that knowledge. This is a biblical doctrine known as eternal security. Now, that particular phrase is not found in the scripture, but the principle is found all through scripture. It's a concept that a person moves from death to life when he is saved, and when that person is saved by placing faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that can never be taken away. That person is eternally sure. God wants you to have knowledge of your eternal security. Every now and then through my ministry, I'll spend time with somebody, sometimes a dear brother and sister in Christ who's been in the church for many years and I believe been saved for many years. I'll say something about heaven and they'll say, well, I hope I go to heaven. Well, my friend, you don't have to hope. You're going to heaven. You can, you can know that you go to heaven. I, I know that I'm going to heaven. You say, well, that's pretty arrogant, pastor. No, the scripture says here that we're supposed to know. Listen to what it says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Not that you may think or wonder, but that you may know. Listen. I recognize there are some very sincere and well-meaning Christians who disagree with me on the fact that once a person is saved, he's always saved. But I believe the weight of the scripture is firmly in, in, uh, behind me when I talk about eternal security. And I must say, this is a significant belief that we need to understand. Because when we understand that security, we can really appreciate the importance of the helmet of salvation when we engage in spiritual battle. So I'm gonna take just a few minutes to build the case for eternal security. If you're taking notes, you might write these down because I'm gonna go quickly. Listen to me, uh, to the words of Jesus in John chapter five, verse 24. Jesus says this, truly I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Now stop right there. Anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me. In other words, it's not automatic. Salvation is available, but it's not automatic. This is not universalism. You have to determine whether to trust in Jesus or reject Jesus. If you've not trusted Jesus for your salvation, if you base your hope in anything else or yourself, you have no reason for security. But when you trust Jesus, that's what it says, and you believe him who sent me, he has eternal life. Uh, he has, has eternal life. Do you see that? And then look what it says, will not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. Now just leave that passage on the screen. And I want you to notice a couple of things about that. Jesus says, anyone who believes in him has eternal life. That is present tense, right now. Uh, some people have the mistaken idea that if you trust Jesus, when you die, you'll have eternal life. No, when you trust Jesus, you have eternal life from that very moment. If you have been saved, you have all the eternal life right now you're ever going to have, and it's glorious. You say, well, what happens when I get to heaven? Heaven is the place where you spend the rest of your eternal life after you complete your eternal life on earth. You have eternal life, present tense, from the moment you're saved. And does it last forever? Well, Jesus says, look back at the passage, that those who are experiencing eternal life will not come under judgment. Do you see that? That phrase will not come under judgment. You can't really appreciate it in the English translation, but in the Greek, this is what's called the perfect tense, perfect tense. It's not used very often in the Greek, so when it is used, you know it's very intentional. And what the perfect tense means is that it's an act that is true now, true, it will be true tomorrow, and is true forever. It is not going to change. You will not come under judgment. It's the reason why Jesus says this in John 10, 27 through 29. My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Who will? Nobody. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. That's pretty secure. Jesus says, when you give your life to Jesus, when will you perish? Never, it says. 
In the Old West, and in even some parts of the Western United States today, when a rancher wants to make a cow his own, in other words, wants to make sure everybody knows it's his herd, what would they do? They'd take a branding iron, get it red hot, and press it into the flesh of that animal. Why? Because there's going to be a logo on that cow for the rest of its natural life here that demonstrates that that cow is identified with its owner forever. And Ephesians 1, 13 says, you want to write that down, you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of the living God when you came to faith in Jesus. Again, this doesn't mean all are saved. Salvation is available to everybody, but it doesn't mean you're automatically saved. Do you see? And, and incidentally, this is where some people bring in the proof texts of people that, that get them confused. Hebrews 6 2 Peter 2, that talk about the fact that somebody has, has tasted the heavenly things, that they've been aware of those, and then they fall away. They didn't fall away from their salvation. They had access to salvation, all the truth, and they walked away from that. When it talks about somebody who fell away, it's talking about somebody who was never saved. You see, you can show up to church and sing all the songs know all the right answers, but only you know in your heart of hearts, if you've still based your faith on your own performance and your own ability, that doesn't mean you're saved at all. No. You know, in the courts today, uh, our, our people are singing a song, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. I love that song. I walked in earlier, got to experience worship in the courts, singing that song. That's a really appropriate song for today. Do you know why? You remember that line in there? Uh, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Do you know that song was written by a man named Robert Robinson when he was 22 years old? Do you also know that he had major struggles with his faith later on in his life? Really doubted a lot of things. And some, it depends on the rich record as to whether he came back to the Lord, those sorts of things. But here's what I know. By all the evidence that we see there, when Robert Robinson trusted Jesus Christ, regardless of those doubts and those struggles, when he trusted Jesus, he was sealed for sure forever. And I expect to meet him in heaven. Do you see? Because all of us have this, this, this sense at times where we tend to wander. And if we don't understand the security of the believer, we start to think, well, maybe I'm not saved at all. No. Why do we know that we have that security? Because God does the work to start with. It's by grace. You can only choose salvation by two ways. You can choose door number one, which is grace, or you can choose door number two, which is works. That's what Ephesians 2 says. And if we choose works over here, the problem is our works will never be enough. So we have to turn from that and say, I choose this door. I choose to rest in this. And listen, it's the same true once you come to faith in Jesus. Listen, I can promise you one thing. When we get to heaven and we're around the throne, you will not find some guy standing there at the throne room singing praises to God and singing the song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. Oh, sorry, you'll hear that. What you won't hear is Amazing Performance. How sweet the sound that saved a pretty good dude like me. No one's going to sing that song. Why? Because the only reason we can be there is because of what Jesus Christ has done. Do you see? And we can be secure in that fact. Listen, in order to, for a Christian to lose his salvation, several things need to happen. We say, well, you know, sometimes people fall away. Here's what would have to happen. If you've been saved for you to lose your salvation, Jesus would have to be made a liar According to John 5, someone would have to go down to the depths of the sea and bring up your sin that's already been buried there, according to Micah 7, 19. And someone would have to rewrite all of Romans 8 because the very first part of Romans 8 says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And the very last part of Romans 8 says nothing can separate us from the love of God. And somebody would have to evict the Holy Spirit who indwells you as a believer, according to Galatians 4, 6, and somebody would have, somehow have to unseal you from the Spirit's promise, according to Ephesians 1, 13. My friend, that's not going to happen. Can you see how profoundly important it is when you're facing spiritual battles that you can have, you can have this assurance from God, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, when the enemy wants to tell you lies about who you are and whose you are? No, the first reason 
that you need to know this when you're entering battle and it will give you victory is because when you get saved, God gives you assurance. Second, I want you to notice, not, God not only gives me assurance, he gives me identity through salvation. He gives me identity. In other words, my salvation means I'm a new person in Jesus Christ, adopted as a son of God. There was an important distinctive attribute to the Roman helmet Paul had in mind for his contemporary readers that they would have known. Let me read to you from War History Online. Listen to this. The Roman helmet had two purposes, protection and identification. Helmets worn by legionaries and centurions had crests made of plumes of horsehair, which were usually red. With the distinct nature of their helmets, it was easy to identify these men in the midst of battle. So can you imagine if you're in a battle and you have this helmet on your head, nobody has to wonder whose side you're on. No one has to guess whether you have earned the right to be in that army or if somebody has commissioned you the right to be in that army. Do you see here? It's been given to you. The Romans blended protection with identification and the same is true for the believer. It's really interesting the way, way Paul phrases this, this uh, command, take the helmet of salvation. The word take is a Greek word that means to receive. It's the reason it doesn't say put on the helmet of salvation. It says to receive the helmet. Salvation is something you receive as a gift from God. It's a gift. The helmet is granted by a commanding officer. This is really significant. Do you see? When we're saved, our identity changes. Listen, God doesn't improve those who are saved. God transforms those who are saved. That's the reason 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation, the old has passed away, and see, the new has come. When you receive the helmet of salvation, do you see, you have been given a new identity, and you fight under that identity. You wage war. You do battle under that identity. Because Jesus answered the question of whether you're a part of the Lord's army on the cross. Paul says here, we take the helmet. And because of that grace, can I give you a little side note? There's another illustration that God uses in the New Testament to help us understand our salvation, and that is adoption. Back in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, for example, we read, He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he lavished on us in the beloved one. You have been adopted. Incidentally, the same allegory is used in Romans chapter 8. We have been adopted. Did you know that in the first century, a, a person in Rome could legally disown his children if they felt like they were unworthy or they didn't measure up? I'm not recommending it. I'm just saying it was legal in Rome. Some of you are like elbowing your kids right now. Hey, just remember... On the other hand, in Rome, once a person was adopted, it was illegal for that adopting family to go back and disown them. So do you understand when Paul's using that picture, you had a more secure position as an adopted child than you did as a natural born child. You were better off being adopted. He's saying you have been adopted. No one is going to take you away because it's based on what the Lord Jesus has done. You don't have to wonder whether or not God loves you when you put on the helmet of salvation. Do you see? He answered that once and for all on the cross. Incidentally, one of the most common objections to eternal security I receive is something like this. Pastor, but if, if we preach this doctrine of eternal security, I mean, if we can be saved no matter what we do after that, then, then everybody's just going to live like the devil from then on. I mean, if it's secure, then why wouldn't you do that? No, no. That's like saying, if we have health insurance, what would stop you from drinking poison or walking on broken glass? That's not the way it works. You don't avoid those things because it, you have insurance. You avoid those things because there's something better for you. And listen, the greatest cause for obedience is not born out of fear. It's born out of our identity in Jesus Christ. You see, there is freedom in obedience. The fact of your salvation is not just some aspect of your life. The fact of your salvation is the very core of who you are. It is your new identity. Do you see the benefits in battle? Salvation gives me assurance. Salvation gives me identity. And finally, I want you to see, salvation gives me confidence. Confidence. What's the difference between assurance and confidence? 
I have blessed assurance that I can rest in the grace of my salvation. And when I have that grace, it gives me a renewed confidence when I go out into the world to do battle every day. Just because we have assurance doesn't mean there's nothing for us to do. No, we are saved for good works. Our new identity empowers us. Do you know when they were building the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco that uh, several people fell off and, and fell to their death in those icy waters, and so it actually stalled the entire construction because the people who were working on the Golden Gate Bridge were terrified. But if you go back and read the account of that bridge being built after it was stalled, guess what they did? At no small expense, they constructed a net underneath the steel that was going up for the Golden Gate Bridge. And all of a sudden, what happened was the people had the power, the confidence to go up on that bridge and do their job, and the job was completed. That's what we have in Christ, do you see? I pray that'll happen for some of you today who are, are just frozen in, in terror about your salvation. You'll take all that energy you've been using to worry about your salvation, and you'll focus on the mission God has for you. Eternal security gives me the confidence to act on God's promises, to maximize the gifts that have been entrusted to me for his glory. Now listen, I'll tell you one place this comes up quite often. I have sat at the bedside of people who are about to die and they're concerned about this. That's where we really start, the doubts start to come out. Or somebody has passed away and I'm sitting at the home or in my office with someone whose loved ones are there and that person's gone on and they just weren't sure. And very often it has to do with some selfish act that person took or some bad day that person had or whatever, or even worse, due to some tragic decision on the day that they died. And so they say, well, are they gonna be in heaven? And some of you have been in that room with me and you've heard what I said. Some of you have been in those funerals afterward and you've heard what I say. I always say the same thing. It's very important. Listen to me. My eternal destination is not based on my worst day. That's not how it works. In fact, you want to know something? My eternal destination isn't even based on my best day. My eternal destination is based on what Jesus Christ has done on the cross and whether I accepted the grace that he offers. Do you see? And when someone takes that step of faith, no one can ever take it away. Now listen, there are some of you in the room and you have doubts or you don't remember. You say it was way back at camp. Or was like, I'm just not sure whether I'm saved today. Well, you can be certain. You can be sure. Does that mean I was saved or not saved? Here's what I can know. Are you saved today? That's the most important question. Have you trusted me? If you're saved, you're saved. I was thinking this morning about um, a time, Len and I had been married about a year, and we went to a, a San Antonio Spurs game, an NBA game, and uh, we were watching the, uh, you didn't have to boo. I heard the boo. So we're watching the game, and during the game, the game's going on, Lana elbows me, and she says, look at the screen. And they were welcoming all the groups that had come, you know, groups come, and they thank the groups. And up on the big screen, it said, welcome to such and such a church. It was the church where we'd been married. But I'm, I'm trying to watch a basketball game, you understand? And it didn't, the, the synapses did not connect in that moment. And so I'm ashamed to say, I should have kept my mouth shut, but I turned to her and said, what about that church? What's, what's the deal about that church? True story. And she said, that's where we were married last year. I said, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll never forget that day. Yeah. Tim Duncan just made a shot. You know. So let's just say theoretically that I really did forget that we'd been married. I said, I just can't remember. Were we married or were we not married? I mean, it was, it was a busy day. I think so, but I'm not positive. That would be ridiculous. But you know what? If that happened... What could happen is I'd have witnesses around me say, I was there. I can show you pictures. We talked about it. I, I, and my wife would say, yeah, remember you said this. And more importantly, like since that time, you behaved in the role of a husband. All those things would be true. So I can look back. I don't have to know the exact day to know that something's true. But even more, we say, well, I just can't get over that. It's bothering me whether I'm married or not married. You know what I can do today? I can renew my vows with Lana. I can settle right today. Okay, now I'm married. You see, I am married. Same thing's true with the Lord. Some of you wrestle with this, you're not sure. You know what you can be sure of? You can rest in the Lord today. Trust him. 
re, just say, Lord, I, I believe I was back then. I'm just not sure, but I know this. I believe that Jesus died for me, rose from the dead for me, and I place my whole hope in Jesus. And you can be certain before you leave here today, you see? We need to know that we're saved. It's so important in spiritual warfare. Why? Because if I'm certain about my victory, I'm free to be bold in my battles. And that's, a, that's the clearest uh, picture that Paul's given us here. When you have a helmet on, you fight differently. And that helmet for us is the assurance of salvation. It's no wonder that in Ephesians 6, 19, right after he outlined this armor, Paul said, pray also for me that the message may be given to me when I open my mouth to make known with boldness in the mystery of the gospel. And he repeats boldness again in verse 20. Why? Because when I know these things, now I can operate in freedom and confidence and boldness. Nothing has more to do with boldness than the knowledge of what Jesus Christ has done for me. Do you see? What can man do to me? What can happen? Uh, I'm going to break some news for you this morning to some of you, but did you know that wrestling's not real? <laughs> Don't get up and leave, but I mean, it's true. On good authority, I know that wrestling's not real. I did not watch wrestling as a kid, and I have a theory about this. I believe that most of the guys who watched wrestling when they were kids had brothers, because I always hear stories, oh yeah, we used to watch wrestling all the time and then we'd, we'd turn off the TV and we'd you know, jump off the top of the couch and we'd you know, step on each other's heads and things like that. And I mean, there wasn't one time that my big sister said, hey, we should watch wrestling and then we should try to hurt each other. It never happened. I had a sister, so I didn't watch wrestling. But I know this, I know it's staged. Like they just determine in advance who's gonna win, how the moves are gonna go and all these things. Do you think there's ever been a time in professional wrestling where the guy who was gonna win the next day had a sleepless night saying, man, I hope things go okay tomorrow. No, why? Because it's all laid out for him in advance. Do you understand what this means that we put on the helmet of salvation? Church, the believer is not fighting for victory in some struggle hoping things work out. The believer in Jesus Christ is fighting from a position of victory, from, from victory. We've received it and that should change everything as to how we do battle. So there's three kinds of people in the room. Those who know you're not saved, those who know you're not saved, or maybe you think you're saved and you're not, but that's between you and God. You have to know, have I placed my faith and trust in Jesus Christ? There's some people who are not saved in the room. Come to Jesus today, and you can be sure forever. There's others in the room, and you wrestle with that, and maybe if you could see from heaven's eye view, you have trusted Jesus, and you're saved, but you wrestle with this every day. Listen, according to the authority of Scripture, you can be certain of your salvation. There's others who are resting in that blessed assurance, and doesn't it change everything? Doesn't it change everything? That's what God has for everybody in the room. Why not today? Why not trust him? Let's bow together, church. Just a moment, I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll have an opportunity to respond. But right here, right now, I wonder if you listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Is there anyone here who needs to trust Jesus as Savior and Lord and settle this for once for all? Are there others in the room that are struggling with doubts and you have for many years, and today the Lord wants you to settle this for once and for all? Put a stake in the ground. Say, Lord, it may have been back at camp. It may have been in my childhood, but right here, right now, I trust you. I trust you today, for sure, forever. I want to know that I'm saved. And for others, would you thank him for what he's given you? And consider how that changes how you walk and act and do battle as you leave here today. So, Heavenly Father, thank you for the power of your word. Thank you for the security in which the believer is called to live. Would you change us? Would you bring us to decision today as a result of what we read from your word? We ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Pastor Ryan Rush here, and I just want to thank you for being with us at Kingsland Online today. What an honor. But I'll tell you what would be even better. We'd love to see you get connected with the physical church in the days ahead, if you haven't already. And that means maybe if you're local in the West Houston area, we'd love to see you at Kingsland. Otherwise, regardless, we'd love to help you facilitate uh, jumping into a local church near you, and we can do that together. You can go to kingsland.org slash online connect, kingsland.org slash online connect to find out next steps on your journey. Listen, thanks again for being with us today at Kingsland Online.